Welcome to the second lecture in the second part, that's the part about digital control of ENB458 and ENN580. I'm Peter Cork, and in this lecture, we're going to keep talking about how we convert transfer functions expressed as Laplace transforms into difference equations, which we can implement in a digital computer. In the last lecture, uh, we touched on a number of points. We talked about the timeline of control from the so-called prehistory of control before uh, James Clark Maxwell in 1868. Uh, and at that time, the control technology of the, of the day was something like the float valve regulator, which we still find in toilet systems today, and the centrifugal governor invented by James Watt. The classical period of control is what you have encountered in previous units, and that era of control gave us tools like Nyquist plot, like the Bode plot, like the root locus diagram, and it is where negative feedback was applied for the first time to electronic circuits. The modern era is really based on the availability of digital computing, and digital computers didn't really arrive uh, on the planet until the late 1940s. It was pushed along massively by the space program and by the Cold War. Basically, how can we build small, compact guidance systems that can take a missile from one point on the planet to another? We looked at compensators, and previously you've learned how to design a compensator. Uh, given a, a plant model, you can design a compensator via a number of techniques, lead compensator, a lag compensator, lead lag, proportional control, proportional integral control. And you express this as a transfer function. And here, for example, is the transfer function S plus four on S plus 20. And we talked last time about how this is simply a function and asked the question, couldn't we just compute this? Instead of building it out of resistors and capacitors and op amps, let's just compute it. And so we spent a bit of the last lecture talking about how we might go about computing it. The other question that uh, we talked a bit about in the last lecture was why digital? Well, uh, some of the answers that we dis discussed last time was it's a lot cheaper than you might think. A small microcontroller costs perhaps 20 cents in quantity. Software essentially costs nothing to manufacture. It costs a lot to write, it costs a lot to write and get it correct. But once it is written, then it costs almost nothing to manufacture. It also allows for really easy integration with networks and displays and user interfaces. So it gives you a control or a level of functionality that you're not gonna get with a bunch of resistors, capacitors, and op amps. And the other point that's increasingly important today is that many sensors and actuators are already digital. So uh, digital encoders that measure the angle of a motor shaft have a digital output. Uh, an H-bridge motor drive has got a digital input. So the fact that sensors and actuators are already digital really makes the case for building a controller digitally. We also talked about number sequences and difference equations. So this particular number sequence given here is a very famous sequence known as the Fibonacci sequence. And we discussed how each element in this sequence can be represented by the difference equation fk equals fk minus one plus f k minus two. In English, what this means is that each element in the sequence is equal to the sum of the two previous elements in the sequence. The subscript k represents the sequence number. So if k equals 10, I'm talking about the 10th element in this number sequence. k minus one is the ninth element, k minus two is the eighth element. Generally, I, I express the sequence number as a subscript, in this case k or k minus one, other times you may see it written uh, using parenthesis notation, uh, like I've shown there in the second line. So we use open bracket K instead of subscript K. I find that's a little bit confusing because the parenthesis notation is also used to denote functions. So I will try to be as consistent as I can and always use subscripts. And we also talked about how difference equations are really useful. And we particularly talked about how we can use difference equations to compute quite high order polynomial functions using simply addition. We don't need to do multiplication. We don't need to do exponentiation. Now, in the old, old days of mechanical computation, multiplication was very, very hard. 
I'm sure you can remember from school how difficult it is doing long multiplication. So multiplication has always been a pain. Now, although we're now in the modern era, this same problem is going to come up again. And that's because these very small microcontrollers that we're talking about using, the guys that cost just 20 cents, are also not particularly good at doing multiplication. Yes, they can do it, but they do it many, many hundreds of times slower than they can do addition. So the problem of multiplication taking a long time is going to come up and bite us again. And so what we've learned about doing things just using addition is going to be very, very helpful to us. So last time when we were talking about how to compute a compensator, we took a transfer function, uh, y over u is equal to s plus 4 and s plus 20. We rearranged it and got it into this form here. And then what we did is we introduced a substitution. And the substitution is that the Laplace variable x is equivalent to the derivative operator. So where we wrote s capital Y before, we can replace that with the derivative of Y with respect to T. So we make a substitution. And we also discussed how we can approximate the derivative for a numeric sequence uh, by a so-called first order difference. So the derivative of y we can approximate as the current value of y minus the previous value of y divided by the time interval. If we do that for y and we also do the same thing for u, so where we had su uh, we replace that by the derivative of u and we replace that by its discrete time equivalent, we end up with this rather messy expression. We can rearrange that and we end up then with an expression. It's a difference equation which represents our compensator. And what this says is that the output of our compensator at time k, that's yk, is equal to some function of the previous output of the compensator plus the current input to the compensator plus the previous input to the compensator. And this is a really easy thing to code. We can code this in a single line of MATLAB. We can code it in a single line of C and embed it into a microcontroller. So let's consider another example. In this case, a second order example. Now, last time when we did this, we only had S on the, in the denominator. This time we got an S squared in the denominator. So we'll do what we did last time. We're going to multiply it out. We're going to expand the brackets. And what we have now is an expression like this. Now, we make the same substitutions that we made last time. We make the substitution that wherever we have the Laplace variable by itself, we replace it by the variable subscript by the sequence number. And actually I've been inconsistent here. I've written x brackets k and I should have written x subscript k. So, so much for consistency. Wherever we have s times x, we replace that with the derivative operator. We replace that with the first order difference. So, wherever we have, uh, where we have the 2ys uh, up there, I'm going to replace that with 2yk, right? Where I have 3sy, I'm going to replace that with three times the first order difference, which is yk minus yk minus one or over delta t. But we've got something we haven't encountered before. We've got this s squared term. Now, if multiplying by s is equivalent to the derivative, then I think we can uh, safely assume that multiplying by s squared is the second derivative. So it's d squared x dt squared. But how do we express that in difference equation form. Well, let's go and look at that. So last time I uh, used this diagram to show how we compute uh, the derivative, the, the first derivative in terms of what's called the first order difference. So the variable minus the previous value of the variable divided by the time interval. Now, more correctly, I should write this as dx dt evaluated at time step k. So that's what the vertical bar and the k means. It's the derivative evaluated at time step k. Now, d squared x dt squared is the db dt of dx dt. So I've broken the, uh, the second derivative into the first derivative applied twice. Now, 
I can then apply the uh, discrete time approximation that I used last time, but instead of taking the difference of xk and xk minus one, I'm taking the difference of the derivative x dot at k minus x dot at k minus one divided by delta t. So I can substitute uh, the expression for x dot that we had above, and our expression now looks like this, and I can multiply that out and do some simplification, and I get this expression. So the second derivative is a function of the current value, the previous value, and the value before that, all divided by delta t squared. So here are the, some finite derivatives. Uh, we have the first derivative and the second derivative, which we just uh, talked about a moment ago. And there's some interesting patterns here. So if we look at the coefficients of the x in the uh, first derivative, uh, we see a one and a minus one. If we look at the coefficients for the second derivative, we see a one, a minus two, and a one. So there's a bit of a pattern happening here. The first is that the first coefficient is always positive. The next one's negative. The next one's positive. Uh, and I suspect that there's an alternating pattern. Also, this particular sequence, one, 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 two, one, is a very famous sequence. And I would speculate that the next the next derivative would have coefficients that look something like this, one minus three, three minus one. So we have that alternating sign sequence, and we also have the next element in this sequence, which is one, three, three, and one. Also note that for the first derivative, the denominator is delta t. For the second derivative, the denominator is delta t squared. And so my Hypothesis is that the third derivative would look something like this. We've got delta t cubed in the denominator, and the top line is the numerator is co has coefficients given by what's written over to the side in red. So, anybody know what this uh, famous sequence is? Okay, the sequence comes from the rows of what's called Pascal's triangle. Uh, Pascal was a mathematician and an inventor who lived in the 1600s. The unit of pressure is named after him. And so the Pascal triangle starts with a one. The second row is two ones. And the subsequent rows are computed by adding elements from the row above. So you can see uh, here that the two in the third row is the sum of the two ones that are above it. And it's quite a simple sequence. So the coefficients in the difference equation for our first order derivative comes from the second row of Pascal's triangle. The coefficients for the second derivative come from this row, the third row. The coefficients for the third order derivative come from the fourth row of Pascal's triangle and so on. Okay, so here's a little exercise for you. Uh, here is uh, a function x of t and I have given you the values for discrete time elements. Uh, our sampling interval is 0.2. And here is a table that shows uh, the sequence number k and the value of the function in the second column. Now, what I'd like you to do is to compute the derivative at the point k equals six, and I'd like you to compute the second derivative at the point k equals seven. I'll give you a few moments to do that. Okay, here's my solution to this problem. So in order to compute the derivative at k equals six, we use the expression we've derived in the last lecture actually for the discrete approximation to the derivative. And we plug in the values for xk and xk minus one. So that would be uh, x5 and pluck the values from the table, substitute in all the numbers and I get an answer of six. Now, for the second derivative at k equals seven, we use the discrete approximation to the second derivative, which we computed a few moments ago, and we plug in the appropriate numbers from the table, uh, crank the handle, and we come up with an answer of minus 1.5. So the first derivative is positive, and the second derivative is negative. All right, that's not too hard. So the next thing that I'd like you to do, another uh, quick classroom exercise, is to finish off this conversion. 
So we started a little while ago to look at this second order transfer function and we multiplied it out and we got the expression there on the second line. And now we're going to make the substitutions for x, sx and s squared x. And we're going to substitute those with the appropriate uh, elements from the numeric sequence of y and, and of u. So what I'd like you to do is to complete this substitution and write that up on the, get somebody to write that up on the board and we'll review the answer in just a moment. All right, here's my solution to the problem. Uh, what we've done is substituted in the, uh, the second order derivative uh, for s squared y, the first order derivative for sy, is substituted just yk, where we have y of s. I've done similar things on the other side of the equal sign. So where we had su, we substituted in the first order derivative approximation for u, and then we have a single uk on the end, uh, which is the transformation of u of s. All right, that's pretty complicated. I'm going to multiply through by delta t squared. Uh, then we're going to gather uh, the like terms. So we pull together all the coefficients uh, of yk, all the coefficients of yk minus 1. Uh, same for uk. And then we rearrange it. So we've got yk on the left, and we divide through by 1 plus 3 delta t to delta t squared. And here we have an expression uh, a difference equation expression that represents that second order transfer function at the top of the page. Quite a complex expression. Uh, it's got delta t's and delta t squareds and so on. Uh, but there you go. If you computed this uh, on a computer, you would implement that transfer function expressed in Laplace transform terms at the top of the page. So another way of looking at this is again borrowing and again borrowing a slide from the previous lecture is we said that uh, S is a black box. If we look at it in a block diagram form, we put in a signal U and what comes out, the signal Y, is the derivative of the signal U. And we approximated this by a difference equation shown there on the right hand side, which by now I'm hoping is somewhat familiar to you. Let's flip this around. So now we put y into the box and u is the output. So if the box above was a derivative operator, this inverse function must be an integrator. So if we cascaded these two, these two blocks, first of all, we take the derivative, then we take the integral, the result is effectively a piece of wire, right? S multiplied by one on S, the S's cancel out, all we're left with is the one, right? Transfer function for a piece of wire. So what I've done is flip the block around, inputs become outputs. Let's rearrange the difference equation and now it looks like this. So what this is saying is if this block truly is an integrator, then this difference equation expression must be the difference equation for an integrator. Let's drill down into this in a bit more detail and see in sort of geometric terms what this difference equation represents. So you remember from high school days that integration is, is the, gives you the area underneath a curve. So here we have a curve again, sampled at uh, discrete time points indicated by the blue dots. And we're saying that U is the, is the area underneath the curve. So what I've shaded in blue is the area under the curve up to now, up to time step K minus one. And the difference equation that we had before says that the area under the curve up to time k is equal to the previous area under the curve plus delta t times yk. So if I draw that, that last term, uh, it is the area of this particular block here. So this is a block that's yk tall, delta t wide. Its area is delta t times yk. So this makes sense, right? What we're saying is that the area under the curve is the blue area, our previous estimate of the area under the curve, previous estimate of the integral, plus we're going to add the orange area to that to get a new estimate of the area. Now this is a very classical approach to numerical integrations called backward rectangular integration. And 
We can see that it's not really a very perfect way to do integration. It's overestimating the area underneath the curve. Uh, we've got quite a bit of that orange rectangle is above the line. That's not really proper. And we can do better than that. So let's, let's try again. I should also mention that uh, this particular approach is also called Euler integration, named after famous Swiss mathematician Leonard Euler. Many, many things in mathematics are named after Euler. So his name appears on all manner of, uh, of techniques, and his name is also associated with this means of doing integration. So let's go and look at a more sophisticated way of doing integration. And we are going to use an expression like this. So uk minus one, as before, is our previous estimate of the area under the curve. And we're going to add this term here. So this is the orange rectangle shown. It's a block that's delta t wide by yk minus one tall. So there's an error there that should be yk minus one. And that's not, that's going to dramatically underestimate the integral. So let's add a little wedge on the top here, a little triangular piece whose width is delta t and whose height is yk minus yk minus one. We divide it by two to give us the area of the triangle. And we're going to add that on as well. So here is a more polished expression for the area underneath the curve. The previous area plus the area of the orange rectangle plus the area of the red triangle. Here's an expression for an integral. Now, we can simplify that and uh, it's reasonably tidy expression. Back to where we were a couple of slides ago, here's our expression for uh, the area underneath the curve, the integral. Now we can rearrange that, flip it around. So now we have an expression for a derivative. It's a slightly different expression to the derivative that we had above. But remember that the expression for the derivative that we had above if we invert that, it gives us a very crude approximation to the integral. What we've done now is come up with a more polished expression for an integral. We flip that around. We should have, therefore, a more polished expression for a derivative. Now, in order to make things a little bit tidier, we're going to drop the subscript notation and we're going to introduce an operator. And the operator is z to the minus one. And what that does is it delays a signal. So if I have got a signal xk, if I multiply it by z to the minus one, it's been delayed. So now it is the previous value of xk, xk minus one. Sounds a little bit complicated, but uh, let's try and put that into context. So here is the expression that we have for our improved derivative. Now, what I'm gonna do now is to substitute uh, wherever I have yk, uh, I am going to write capital Y because we have applied a transform here. And wherever I had, say, yk minus 1, I'm going to replace that with z to the minus 1 times y. I'm going to do the same thing for u. Wherever there was a uk, I'm going to replace it with u. Wherever I have a uk minus 1, I'm going to replace it with z to the minus 1 times u starting to look a little bit like Laplace transform. I'm using capital letters again to represent uh, the two signals, y and u. I've dropped the subscripts and I've introduced this z to the minus one thing. And we'll have a lot to do with z to the minus one for the rest of this unit. It's, it has a similar role to s in the Laplace transform. Now I can rearrange this expression. Uh, I can bring all the y's over to one side and then I can put it into transfer function form. Y over U is equal to this expression. Uh, it's, a tr it's a ratio of two expressions in Z to the minus one. Now, this is an improved estimate of a derivative. Uh, so what we can do is wherever we find an S in a Laplace transform, we can replace it with this expression containing Z to the minus ones. So what I'd like you to do is to repeat this derivation for the backward derivative case. So here's the backward derivative operator uh, that we've seen a number of times now. And what I'd like you to do is to do this substitution, introduce z to the minus one, and rearrange it so that we have 
capital Y over capital U. I'll give you a couple of minutes to complete this one. All right, this is how I did it. Uh, what I'm gonna do is where there is YK, I'm gonna replace it with capital Y. Where there's U, I'm gonna replace it with capital U. And where there's a U, uh, the previous value of U, U K minus one, I'm gonna replace that with Z to the minus one multiplied by U. Uh, a little bit of algebra so that I can get Y over U. And now I have an expression that contains the Z to the minus one operator again. Once again, uh, this transfer function, y over u, represents a derivative operator which is equivalent to the Laplace transform operator s. So wherever I have an s, I could substitute this expression containing z to the minus 1. Okay, so let's recap here. If I want to convert a transfer function that contains s into a difference equation, but a difference equation represented more tidily using this delay operator, this z to the minus one operator, I can perform either of these two substitutions. I can perform the backwards rectangular integration or Euler integration substitution. So I can say s equals one minus z to the minus one over delta t, or I could use the second expression, which represents uh, a more perfect form of numerical integration and also of numerical differentiation. So I could transform transfer function from an expression in S to an expression in Z to the minus one by performing either of these two substitutions. They have, each of them have pros and cons, and we'll talk about those more in next lecture. Now, Another way we can perform a transformation between the expressions represented with the Laplace variable s and the variable we just introduced, z, is to perform this transformation where we say z is equal to e to the st. That's a pretty interesting expression. If we invert that, it says that z to the minus 1, this delay operator that we introduced a few moments ago, is equal to e to the minus s. T. This is a pretty unintuitive expression, but what it's saying is that delaying a signal in the Laplace domain using s is equal to e to the minus s times t. These are two ways of considering a delay. We can consider a delay as z to the minus 1, or we can consider it as e to the minus s t. Now, the z transform is typically done by was typically tabulated and in most control books there are tables of z transforms and in the uh, blackboard site i have posted a pdf file that contains z transforms uh, you'll find lots of z transform tables on the on the web you, know, you find them on wikipedia or whatever so this particular table the one that i've handed out to you via blackboard contains four columns so the second column is an expression uh, in is a Laplace transform. So let's look at uh, the, the fourth row where we see one on S squared. Uh, it's equivalent to uh, this, what we call the Z transform, which is T multiplied by Z over Z minus one all squared. So if there is an expression in the Laplace domain, we can look it up in a Z transform table to get the equivalent expression in terms of z. So this is a third way of converting from Laplace transform space to uh, what we call the z transform space using this variable z and we know that z to the minus one equals a delay of the signal by one time step. More formally the z transform can be written like this and all it really does is to take a sequence of numbers uh, like you know, one, two, three, four, five, and returns a geometric series uh, where each element in the number sequence is multiplied by z to the minus k. We know that z is a delay operator. Z to the minus k is a delay of k time steps. So it maps a sequence of numbers to a geometric series in z. And this variable z plays a similar role to what s does in a continuous time system. 
you become much more familiar with these concepts of, of z and z to the minus one as we go through the rest of this unit. Now, the Z transform has got some interesting properties. I use this curly Z to represent the Z transform and I represent curly F to represent a Laplace transform. So you know, curly F could represent some kind of transfer function, right? So the Laplace transform of curly F is F of Z and we would look that up in a Z transform table. The Z transform linear. So if I multiply the function in the S domain by alpha, it's multiplied by alpha in the Z domain. It's also linear if I add two functions in the S domain, I can also add them in the Z domain. Uh, if I take a linear combination in the S domain, I have a linear combination in the Z domain. Time shift is an interesting one. If I have a signal in the Laplace domain multiplied by this exponential, which we talked about a moment ago, representing time delay, then in the Z domain, uh, it is that same function. It's the Z transform of the function F pre-multiplied by Z to the minus N. So the delay, which is an exponential in the Laplace domain is Z to a power in the Z domain. Important thing to be wary of is that if you have the product of two functions in the Laplace domain, they is, it is not equal to the product of their transforms in the Z domain. Uh, important trap for beginners. Be aware of that one. There's yet another way of converting from the S domain to the Z domain. So consider here a fairly general expression for a transfer function. We have a number of zeros, uh, zero at B1, at B2, all the way up to, uh, up to B at NB. So NB is the number of zeros. And we have a number of poles also. So we make a simple substitution. Where we have one of these brackets, S plus something, we replace it by one minus Z to the minus one by e to the minus c delta t. So quite a simple substitution of one bracket to another bracket which contains z to the minus one multiplied by some coefficient. And that then allows us to write the equivalent transfer function in the z domain uh, like this. And this technique is also called pole zero mapping. We're essentially mapping the poles and zeros from the s domain to the Z domain. And we'll talk a lot more about this in the next lecture. So if we want to discretize a system, convert it from the Laplace domain to the Z domain, there are a number of ways we've talked about of doing this. We can make this substitution or this substitution, or we can uh, perform a Z transformation. And we generally look those transforms up in a table of Z transforms. Or we can do this pole zero mapping, also called the matched Z transform, uh, by making this substitution. There are four different ways of discretizing a system. Each has got advantages and disadvantages. There are more than four ways of doing it, but these are the four most common ways, and in my view, the four most useful ways of doing it. And in the tube today, what we're gonna do is look at the difference between these four approaches at turning a system from continuous time, Laplace transform, into discrete time difference equation land. If we consider a compensator, uh, now we write it in an expanded form. So previously we had a factored form. Uh, here it is an expanded form. So we have a polynomial in Z to the minus, in Z to the minus one, divided by another polynomial in Z to the minus one. We can actually represent this in terms of a signal flow graph. And what we show here in the diagram at the bottom is we have our incoming signal U and it goes into a shift register essentially. It goes into a sequence of delays. So after the first Z to the minus one block, we have U to K minus one. That's the previous value of U. Delay it again and we have the previous, previous value of U and so on. The output of our of our transfer function is yk. We also pass that through a series of delays. So here the delays are going from right to left. 
So we see that the delayed signals are YK minus one, YK minus two, YK minus three, and so on. Now, if we take these delayed values of Y and the delayed values of U, and we feed them into a long chain of, uh, of adders, uh, we can basically, we can close the loop. So YK can be expressed in terms of the addition of old values of itself, old values of Y, and old values of u, including right up to uh, the most recent value of u. So the coefficients in these uh, two polynomials are the, the coefficients or the gains that appear in this signal flow form. So any compensator, any transfer function that you can represent in this polynomial form, the ratio of polynomials, you can represent in a flow graph like this. So a difference equation can also be represented in terms of a signal flow graph with delay blocks and adder blocks. Let's go back to Fibonacci numbers that we talked about earlier, represented by this quite simple difference equation. What we can do is we can write uh, the current value of the Fibonacci sequence, Fk. Let's delay it by uh, one time step. So we have the previous value of the Fibonacci sequence. Let's delay it by another time step and we have the previous value of the Fibonacci sequence. The difference equation there says that Fk is equal to those two delayed values. So let's add them together and feed them into Fk. So here we have a very simple block diagram. It contains two delays and a single adder. And if we implemented this, then every time step, it would crank out another number in the Fibonacci sequence and it would run forever and produce bigger and bigger numbers. So a simple block diagram of a difference equation. Now, a little bit of revision, because what's interesting about these uh, difference equations is we want to understand when they're stable. The Fibonacci sequence just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And oftentimes we're in control, in particular we're interested in stability. Does a system's output get bigger and bigger and bigger or does it decay uh, gracefully to zero? So in order to understand that, we're going to do a little bit of revision. We're gonna go back to how we solve a differential equation. And this is something that you should have done in maths a little time ago. Maybe you're a bit rusty on it. I was a bit rusty on it. So here's my take on how we solve a differential equation. Fairly simple second order differential equation here. Now, the way we do this is we postulate the solution. We believe that x of t is going to be an exponential with a time constant lambda. So we start by assuming the solution. And for these kind of DEs, this is a particularly good assumption. So let's make a substitution now. So where we had x dot dot, we're gonna replace it by the double derivative of x. Uh, so that will be lambda squared e to the lambda t. And do the same thing for x dot and also substitute x in there at the end. So we got six e to the lambda t equal to zero. That's a bit interesting. And we can factor that, we can factor out e to the lambda t. So now we have this expression. Now, in order for this to be equal to naught, two things, either of two things must be true. One is that e to the lambda t is equal to naught, and that will only be the case when t equals infinity. So the other reason then that this expression will be equal to naught is that the second term here, what's called the characteristic equation, is equal to naught. So we can write lambda squared minus five lambda plus six equals zero, All right? If this is true, then the solution of the equation above must be zero. It's called the characteristic equation. And you can see that the coefficients of the, of the lambdas here are the coefficients of the x terms in the equation right at the top of the page. The solutions of that polynomial are lambda equals two or three. And so therefore we can write the solution of our differential equation as the sum of two exponentials. It's e to the two t and e and e to the three t. We don't know the coefficients here. So C1 and C2 are two unknown coefficients, but we know that the solution contains some amount of exponential with time constant of two, 
and some amount of an exponential with a time constant of three. We call this the general solution. In order to solve for C1 and C2, we need the boundary conditions. We need, to un we need to have a value for x or x dot at a particular value of time so that we can solve for C1 and C2. There are two unknowns here, C1 and C2, so therefore we need two boundary conditions in order to be able to solve them. The other thing that's pretty immediately obvious now from looking at this solution is that it's not stable. Right, so we have e to the 2t, so as t increases, e to the 2t is going to increase, and e to the 3t is going to increase. So this solution does not have, sorry, this equation does not have a stable solution. It grows without bound. We're going to do a similar trick with a difference equation. So here is a simple second order difference equation. And we are going to assume that the solution to the difference equation is lambda to the i. So x at time step i is equal to lambda to the power of i. And we're going to substitute this into the original difference equation and we're going to get an expression like this. We can factor that, we can pull out lambda to the k minus two multiplied by something that looks suspiciously like uh, the characteristic equation we had in the previous slide. Now, in order for this to be equal to zero, one of two conditions must be true. Uh, one is that lambda to the k minus two equals zero. So let's think about that for a moment. If lambda is greater than one, then as I raise it to increasing powers of k, it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. It will never be equal to zero. If lambda is less than one, then as I raise it to higher powers of k, it's going to get smaller and smaller. And when k equals infinity, it's going to be equal to zero. But that's a hard road to getting this equation equal to zero. A much uh, quicker way is for this equation here, the characteristic equation, to be equal to zero. This is uh, a quadratic and we solve it and we have the solutions lambda equals two or lambda equals three. So now we can write the general solution for this difference equation, x at time k, I've been inconsistent again, I should use subscript, not brackets, is equal to two terms. Uh, there are two unknown gains, uh, unknown coefficients, c1 and c2. Uh, but the two terms are two to the power of k and three to the power of k. So pretty immediately clear here that this difference equation is not stable. Every time step, uh, the first term is gonna get bigger and bigger, and so is the second term. So two, as we increase k, it's gonna go two, four, eight, 16, 32, and so on. And, also, and the second term is also gonna grow. So uh, by looking at this difference equation, looking at its solutions, its roots, two and three, because they're bigger than one, uh, we, can, we, we can determine that the solution is gonna grow without bound. So this is a simple way of determining the stability of a difference equation. And we're gonna visit this again more in the next lecture. But this is just to give you uh, a bit of a flavor for thinking about the stability of these difference equations. So let's summarize what we've learned in this lecture. We've talked about how we can express difference equation using the shift operator z or z to the minus one. z to the minus one being a delay of one time step. We discussed four different ways to convert from the Laplace transform to a difference equation. Each way has got its own pros and cons and we're gonna talk about those in the next lecture. We talked about how we can represent a difference equation as a signal flow graph where we have a bunch of delay blocks and a bunch of adders, and we connect all the current version and old versions of the output, the current version and old versions of the input together in the right way to produce the current value of the output. We also looked at how we can determine the stability of a difference equation from the roots of its characteristic equation. In the next lecture, we're going to start talking about how we choose the sampling time. We've used delta t uh, pretty consistently in the last couple of lectures. How do we choose what delta t should be? We're going to talk about d to a converters because they play a really important part in any digital control system. 
we're going to talk about how we design controllers using the Z transform. We're going to do we're going to revisit the root locus method, for example. And we're also going to go back to state space form. So far, we've been talking about compensators expressed uh, as ratios of polynomials. We want to use the, the a discrete time version of the state space formulation that you did in the first part of this unit. So that's what we're going to be doing next lecture. What I'd like to do now is spend a few moments talking about the PRAC. As you know, uh, the PRAC is going to be about building a Lego version of a Segway. To do that, we're going to be using the Lego NXT technology, which has got the NXT controller, uh, the so-called brick, and a Lego motor or two. And here's an example of a Lego Segway. And what's really, the really important element in this uh, Lego Segway is this little gadget on the side. This is a gyro sensor. And what it does is provide the Segway sense of balance. It can determine whether it's falling forwards or falling backwards. Now it doesn't measure the angle. It measures the rate of change of the angle. So I want to spend a few moments talking about gyroscope sensors, what they, what they produce, and what are the problems with the signal that gyroscope sensors produce and how we might go about overcoming them. So this particular gyroscope sensor that LEGO provide measures the rotation around this axis that I've shown here in blue. Right? So it measures rotation around that, uh, that blue axis. So within our heads, we have sensors that are functionally equivalent to gyroscopes. Deep inside your ear, there is this mechanism called the semicircular canal. In fact, we have three semicircular canals in each ear, and they function as gyroscopes. They are biological devices that determine the rate of change of angle around three orthogonal axes. And these sensors are pretty critical to keeping you balanced. They will help you stay upright. Very, very important sensors. And interestingly, they function pretty much the same as a gyroscope. The mechanism is different, but in terms of the function, in terms of the signal they produce, very, very similar to a gyroscope. Okay, a gyroscope is, um, a, sim a simple gyroscope is a device with a spinning disc. And this is a, a toy. Uh, you may well have had one of these when you were a kid. And you can do things like balance it on the end of a pencil or balance it on a string. Uh, pretty interesting devices. Uh, not particularly well understood, perhaps. Another thing you can do that demonstrates gyroscopic effects is with a bicycle wheel. And I'm not sure if any of you have actually done this, but you spin a bicycle wheel and then you try and rotate, you hold it uh, in, your, in your two hands and you try and rotate it around one axis. And what it does is when you try and rotate it, it, it tries to, to fight you and rotate around a different axis. What's going on here? The gyroscope's got angular momentum, which we represent by a vector quantity h. It's angular momentum, so it's momentum around that axis that I've shown there in red. Now, if I try and rotate the gyroscope, that's all right. If I try and rotate the gyroscope around the axis omega, so rotate it with an angular velocity around the blue axis, then it's going to fight me by exerting a torque around the green axis. So if I try and rotate uh, the wheel around the vertical axis, it's going to try and rotate around a horizontal axis. And these quantities are all represented by this very simple cross product expression. So how's that useful to us in sensing balance? The sensor that's inside the NXT gyroscope sensor is an, a MEMS gyroscope. The MEMS stands for micro-machined electromechanical system. And I'm not exactly sure what type of device is inside the NXT, but it's going to be something like this. And it's going to be fabricated on silicon using the sort of etching technology that's used to produce chips. It's used to produce a very, very small machine. So 
Here's an example of a MEMS gyro. This one, this particular one's made by Bosch, and it contains a rotor that oscillates. It doesn't rotate continuously like a motor, it rotates backwards and forwards. So it has an angular, uh, an angular momentum H, just like the bicycle wheel did. Now, if I rotate this sensor around the blue axis with an angular velocity omega, the rotating disc is going to have a torque exerted on it around this green axis. So this rotor is sprung so that if a torque is exerted on it around this axis, it's going to move in such a way that one side of the disc is going to kick up, the other side of the disc is going to kick down. Now, there are some capacitive distance sensors in here, and so they measure the change in displacement. One side of the disc goes up, one side of the disc comes down, and from that then we can compute the torque that's exerted on the disc, if I know the angular momentum, then I can infer what is the vo angular velocity uh, that has been imposed on the gyroscope. That's the signal that I want to measure. So it's a little bit involved, right? We're not measuring omega very directly. We're looking at the consequence of omega on a spinning disc, which exerts a torque, which fights against the spring, which causes a displacement, which we can measure. So a bit indirect, but MEMS gyroscopes are remarkable technology. It's come on in leaps and bounds over the last five years, uh, driven particularly by uh, portable devices, by iPhones, by tablets and whatever, that all have a number of these micro-machine gyroscopes within them to determine their orientation. So a gyroscope then outputs a signal, omega, related to omega rather, and omega is the derivative of angle. So it's the time derivative of angle. So what we want for our balancing Segway type robot is we want to know the actual angle of the Segway, right? Now we can get that by integrating the angular velocity omega. Now, unfortunately, the signal that comes out of the gyroscope is not perfect. And we can consider in the general case that the signal out of the gyroscope, I'm going to call it V, is equal to some scale factor times the angular velocity that it's experiencing plus B, which is a bias. K should be 1, B should be equal to 0. In the real world, no, neither of those two things is true. So if I integrate the signal V with respect to time, I get some scale factor times theta, that's okay, theta is the thing that I'm really interested in, but I also have this term b times t. So if there's a small bias in the output of a gyroscope, then what that's going to do is cause a signal that grows linearly with time. So if it, gives, if it initially gives me a good estimate of the angle, as time goes by, this term b t gets bigger and bigger and bigger and is going to dominate the actual angle that I'm estimating from the output of the gyroscope. And this is a real problem with gyroscope sensors. How do we estimate this value of B? Because if I know B and I subtract it from the output of my gyroscope and then integrate that, the result will be K theta. So the question is, how do I estimate this value of B? So one thing you could do is to simply leave your gyroscope steady, not moving, just sit it on the desk and watch it. And if there is an output from the gyroscope, since omega is equal to zero, if there is an output, that must be B. So I could just put the gyroscope on the desk, look at the output and say, okay, that's B. Then I could subtract B from the output of the gyroscope integrated and bang, I've got theta. I also have to estimate K, but maybe we can just assume that K equals one uh, for, the t for the time being. The problem with that is that B is rarely constant. It's generally a function of temperature. So as the gyro warms up, uh, as it's been running for a long time, uh, B will change. Uh, the temperature in the room changes, B will change, and we're going to have this problem with the bias. So what can we do about that? Well, one thing we can do is to create an estimator for the bias, and in real time, estimate what the gyro bias is, subtract it off, and then integrate the result. So. What we're going to do in the prac tonight is to actually start to explore some of these things. We're going to take a real NXT gyro, we're going to look at the bias, we're going to look at how the bias changes, and we're going to look at ways of estimating the bias and compensating for it.
So one of the things you're going to do is look at this little model here, which is S implemented in Simulink. And it looks a little bit complicated. I'm going to walk you through it and uh, hopefully get an idea of what it does. So the first block here, it'll, it'll, the first group of blocks represents the gyroscope sensor itself. So the input to it is the actual angle of the segue. And what I do is put it through a derivative block. And now I have the angular velocity of the segue. Then I'm going to add a bias to it. In this case, I just chose a number of 0.2. And so the output of this block is the angular velocity with a bias added to it. So angle comes in, what comes out is angular velocity with a bias. So that simulates what a real gyroscope will do. This block up here is the rate integrator. So what I do is I take the output of the gyro, I subtract the bias, and where that bias comes from we'll talk about in just a moment. So I, I take the output of the gyro, subtract the bias, and then integrate it, and the result then is my estimate of the angle of the segue. Where does the estimated bias come from? Well, it comes from this block down the bottom. And what we do is we assume that on average, the gyroscope is horizontal. Now, that's perhaps a rather naive assumption, but it's not a bad assumption and it will serve us quite well here. So what we do is we have an integrator within uh, this system here, which is estimating the bias. So we take the output, the estimated angle, and we integrate that very slowly over time to get an estimate of what the bias is on the gyroscope. The graph that's shown down here in the bottom left shows an estimate of what that bias is. And we can see that the estimate of the bias starts off at zero. It's, uh, it's a little bit oscillatory, but it goes up to about 0.25 and then falls down to around 0.2. So it has converged on the bias that I added to the gyroscope. So although I chose a bias of 0.2, the bias estimator doesn't know that. It's figured out a bias of 0.2 all by itself. The graph that's over on the right-hand side shows the true angle of our segue and the estimated angle of our segue. The true angle is blue, the estimated angle is red. And we can see initially that there's a bit of error. And that's due to the fact that we've we're using the wrong value of the bias. But as the bias estimator runs for a while, by about 20 seconds, our bias estimator has got a good handle on the bias. By subtracting that off, we're getting a pretty perfect estimation of the angle by integrating the output of the gyro. So there you go. Here's a way of estimating the bias of the gyro, subtracting that off in real time, integrating it up, to estimate the angle. And in the Practonite, you're gonna play with this particular Simulink model and explore the properties of the gyro sensor. The last thing that I want to bring your attention to today, and this is the last slide, is there is an information session for any of you that might be considering postgraduate research, a master's degree or a PhD degree. Uh, if you're interested, there is an information session this Wednesday from one till three. And if you want to go, then you should RSVP to David Caballele and his email address is given there. Uh, so if you are considering further study, then I commend this session to you, get a bit of a handle on what postgraduate education is about, what's involved and uh, perhaps help decide uh, whether it's for you or not. That's the end of this lecture. Uh, Thanks very much for your attention.